Hello everyone and thank you very much for coming. I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to participate in the Congreso Futuro. And my talk will be on the future of intimacy. So our time is a time of rapid change, right? And I think we're gonna see that throughout this whole week. And that's true also for intimacy. I think that Really, we see some profound transformation today in the way that we build relationship and experience sex. And this is particularly true for the young generation. In many ways, young people are redefining intimacy. So how is that? What's new? What's there to see in this? What trends are there? If you go to the media to get your answers, you will actually get a lot of contradictory reports. Uh, we have heard about the young generation being a hypersexual generation. And then recently we've been told that there's actually a sex recession, that young people are having less sex or even not sex at all. The media has also made very big, big headlines about the Tinder generation. But then we have recent reports telling us that actually young people are quitting online dating altogether. And this is supposedly the end of the hookup culture. So media narratives are very contradictory and actually they are quite far from the uh, truth. And so let's turn to science instead to get our answers. Today, in many countries, we have large-scale surveys on intimate relationships, on sexual behaviors and attitudes. And I will talk about a big survey that we made in France in 2023. Uh, it's a random sample of more than 10,000 young people aged 18 to 29 years old. Uh, and it's really one of the most ambitious surveys ever made that looks into the intimate lives of young people. There was another survey made about the same time in Chile. Uh, it's a survey on sexual behaviors and attitudes, also intimacy. Uh, it was a big sample, more than 20,000 people aged 18 or more. Uh, and I'm going to compare these two surveys. Um, and to do that, I'm going to focus on individuals who are 18 to 29. And what's interesting is that both these surveys, the French one, the Chilean one, we can compare them to prior studies that were made some 20, 30 years ago, which means that we can see what has happened over time. We can look into change over time. And when we do that, we see some remarkable change. I'm going to focus on three results, three big trends that you see in both countries and actually over uh, the globe in the Western world. Uh, what we see is, first of all, a uh, growing in diversity of intimate relationships. Second, we see an increase in sexual minorities. And third, we see a decline in the female-male divide. And so, let's go into details. And let's start with the first result, a growing diversity of intimate relationships. What does that mean? It actually means two things. There is a quantitative change to start with. Young people of today have more sexual partners than young people of yesterday. What you see here is the mean number of sexual partners among 18 to 29 year olds. We have France and Chile. We can compare the French survey from 2023 with an older survey from 2006. And what we see is the mean number of partners has gone up for men from 8 to 12 partners and for women from 4 to 8 partners. In Chile, we can compare to a survey that was made in 98. And we can see that the mean number of sexual partners went from 5 to 7 for men and from 2 to 4 for women. You can see that men and women don't count 
their sexual partners the same way, there are differences. But for both genders, we see an important rise in sexual partners. It's more moderate in Chile, but it's still significant. This is the same result, it's just a different way of looking at the data. It's the share of 18 to 29 years old who say that they had more than 10 partners. And you can see in France, as well in Chile, that the change is really happening among women. In 2006, 6% of young women in France said that had more than 10 partners. In 23, it's 19% of them. In Chile, in 98, really, really small percent, only 1% of women said that they were very sexually experienced. In 2022, it's 8% of them. So partners, number of partners are going up. Why? Is online dating too, you know, not to blame, but can it under, help us understand? Well, I think so, but I think there's a much more important reasons. It's youth has changed, young adults has changed, meaning that young people settle in later today, and before building a family, before settling down, they today have a period of sexual and relational experimentation, and they have more partners. So in that regard, there's no sex recession in sight. The quantitative change comes with a qualitative one. It's the fact that young people have coined new terms to describe their partners and relationships. They have still couple relationships, but they also have hookups. They have situationships. They have sex friends, friends with benefits. Lots of terms going around. I know that in Spanish there are also local terms. Of course, in many languages there are local variations. But you really see a general trend. And I think what's really interesting, it's not only a new way of naming relationships, it's a new way of forming relationships. And what is new and particularly interesting is all these terms that revolve around friendship. The young generation have invented or spread relationships that mix, well, not sex and love, but sex and friendship. And you see this in Chile in a very significant way. In the last survey, people were asked, how would you describe your first sexual partner? Was it a fiancé? Was it your spouse? Was it your friend, your sex friend, or something else? 18 to 29-year-olds in Chile, one-third of them said it was a friend or a sex friend, whereas older generations say, well, it was my fiancé. And you see this trend in other parts of the world as well, North America, Europe, and Latin America. So what do I mean when I say there's a growing diversity of intimate relationships? Well, there used to be two ways of conceiving of relationships, essentially two ways of being intimate, at least the way we imagined it, couple relationships and casual relationships. Well, young people have invented new ways of being intimate. It's kind of a relationship that's in between. It's not a casual relationship because it's not a one-night stand, because it can last for weeks or months. But it's not a couple, because it's not based on love. There can be affection, but there's no romantic involvement, there's no engagement, and it mixes often friendship with sex instead of love, as I said. So, as the Frex sex friends and other types of relationships. And this is a big change because it means that the realm of relational possibilities is actually expanding. So, second result. What we see around the globe, once again, is a big change, it's a broad change around the world. We have a rapid and an important increase in sexual minorities, meaning individuals who identify as LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or other identities. Young people today identify less as heterosexual than young people yesterday. This is what we see in the two surveys in France and Chile. In France, in 2023, 8% of young men and 19% of young women identified as something else than heterosexual. 
That is almost one woman out of five. In Chile, in 2022, 9% of men and 13% of women identified as something else than heterosexual. And these figures should be compared to earlier ones, earlier surveys. In the mid-2000s, was only 3% of young people in France who said they were gay or lesbian or bisexual. In Chile, it was even less. So we actually see a really big rise. And the rise, the rise in sexual minorities is not an increase in the people who identify as gay and lesbian so much as a increase in the number of young people who identify in a, what I call a plurisexual way, it's plurisexual identity. What does that mean? We have bisexuality, it refers to attraction to more than one gender, both women and men. And we have a new term used by the young people, pansexuality, which means that it's an attraction that's not linked to gender. It's kind of a way of saying that you see beyond gender. But they are both ways of expressing that you feel attraction to more than one gender. And when we go into details, we see in France and in Chile that a majority of young people still identifies as heterosexual. It's between 80 and 90 percent. But within the sexual minorities, we have a big change, and we have a, you know, really a, a big group of women who identify as bi or pansexual. And that's really where a lot of the change is happening. It's among young women, and it's this plurisexual identity. So how do we explain that? I think the rise in sexual minorities, LGBT populations in general, is explained by a broader acceptance of these identities today than before. But if you want to explain why women young women specifically identify much more as bisexual and pansexual, we need to put that into perspective with the feminist movement and the Me Too movement that has been very important for these debates around sexuality recently. Today, a significant minority of young women call into question heterosexuality, do not wish to identify with it. This means that the bisexual and the pansexual identity, it's not only about attraction. It's about questioning gender and gender inequality. And in that sense, it's not only a sexual identity, it's also a political one. So, what's new? Well, we used to think of sexual orientation as a opposition between heterosexuality and homosexuality. Once again, the younger generations are blurring boundaries, and this time they're doing it by identifying in ways that challenge binary category as woman and man, straight or gay. And that, once more, is a big change. And that will bring me to my last and third result, which is a decline in the female-male divide. This is one third general trend that we can see in many countries. It means that women and men today are more similar, tend to behave more similarly than yesterday. And this might come as a surprise to you, because I, there's a lot of talk of gender polarization, right? We say that women and men are more and more different. And this is true in many countries when it comes to political opinions and electoral behavior. But when it comes to sexual behavior and sexual attitudes, actually, the gender differences are fading. And I'll take just one example to illustrate this. In the surveys that I looked into, there's a question where respondents are asked, do you think it's acceptable to have sex without being in love? What we see is really a remarkable change. In France, first of all, well, in 2006, more than half of the men thought it was okay to have sex without being in love, but less than a third of women. In 2023, well, women are much more in favor of this, and so the gender differences are fewer. So the gap, the gender gap is narrow. In Chile, 
the change is amazing. In 98, a minority of young people thought it was okay to have sex without being in love. 29% of women, uh, men, sorry, and 11% of women. In 2022, the share of people think that this is okay, actually. The, ch the change in norms is extraordinary. You have a majority of men and women saying it's okay, and the gender difference has really has almost uh, disappeared. So I could have taken another example when it comes to attitudes or behavior. Actually, this gender convergence is something you see in a lot of domains and practices when it comes to intimacy and sex. And that leads me to my concluding remarks. So, what do we make of these trends? What do they tell us about the future of intimacy? I've been telling you about change over the last decades, but I believe that they can give us indications of what direction we're going into. And I see that young people are redefining new ways of building relationships, and they do this by challenging three binary positions. We used to think of couple relationships and casual relationships as something very different and completely opposed. Well, young people are experiencing relationships that don't fit to either category, like the sex friend that mixes friendship and sex. We used to think of heterosexuality as opposed to homosexuality. Well, young people are identifying more and more increasingly as bi and pansexual. And male and female behaviors and attitudes that used to be really different, well, they are more and more similar. So, you may approve of this or dislike it. You may be enthusiastic or alarmed by these results. Of course, my presentation carries no moral judgment. These are scientific observations and hypotheses. But when science looks into the future, well, we see a very much more complex landscape. And my conclusion is not to say that by tomorrow, all of the young people will be bisexual, they will only have sex from it's the end of the couple, and everyone's going to be non-binary. That's not my conclusion. My conclusion is that the young generation are doing things differently. They are inventing new ways, a third way. We need to see beyond binary frameworks if we want to understand what the young are doing, what they're up to, and where they're heading. We need to see beyond old oppositions. And only then can we get glimpses into the future of intimacy. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>